Welcome everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here in our Dementia Research Oxford seminar. And today we're uh, very grateful to have John Gallagher joining us and talking about developments in dementia translation. For those who don't know, John is Professor of Cognitive Health here at the University of Oxford. And he's also Director of DPUK, Dementia Platform UK, which is uh, an MRC funded private public partnership and he's really been instrumental in trying to galvanize research into dementia in UK and I think uh, we could safely say he's one of the few people who has a very good understanding of the landscape of what's going on in the UK both in terms of preclinical research clinical research and also in terms of large-scale uh, data interactions with pharma. So John, please tell us about developments in dementia translation. Okay, well, Masood, thank you very much for, for your, your kind words and good, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I will be talking about the broader landscape uh, and I will uh, zoom in at some point into Dementia's Platform UK. So I'm going to be looking at the complexity of the problem, um, the development of treatments and the landscape. Um, most of you will know this, but just in case there's some that, that don't, uh, I'm going to be looking at uh, Alzheimer's disease as an exemplar uh, to illustrate the complexity of the problem. Here we have an uh, image of uh, the uh, pathology associated with Alzheimer's disease, the characteristic pathology we have effectively, uh, extracellular uh, amyloid plaques, and we have uh, intracellular tau tangles. And you obviously look at these, uh, uh, you can look at them at neuropathologically post-mortem, uh, you can detect them with uh, PET imaging, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but this is the, these are the key uh, symptoms, or I should say signs, uh, that, uh, that Alzheimer's disease uh, shows. <clears throat> to some extent, it has a genetic basis. And uh, the beauty of this graph is it shows you uh, where you have familial Alzheimer's disease with uh, uh, variants of presenilin 1, presenilin 2, APP, um, it's very much a genetic uh, condition. Uh, in one sense, the, the, the pathways are identifiable. They may be complex, but uh, uh, we have a, an audit trail going from these genes. However, for sporadic Alzheimer's disease, giving very similar symptoms, developing more slowly, um, there's a, there are a whole load of variants, and of course, this just adds complexity. And as you can see, uh, the common variants uh, to the right of the graph, th these will have uh, various uh, impacts, uh, uh, express themselves in different phenotypes, and you know, a gene may have more than one phenotype, et cetera, et cetera. So it, be it becomes a very, very complex uh, problem. Um, uh, so what is going on um, to, uh, we're just going to look at amyloid now as, as one uh, example. Uh, here we have uh, uh, APP polypeptide uh, being processed as it goes through the, the cell membrane and where it's cleaved by alpha secretase, uh, uh, the, uh, if you like, it's a non-amyloidogenic pathway. There are no, uh, it, if SAPP alpha goes and assists um, uh, synaptic health, uh, synapse formation. But uh, for whatever reason, uh, there's another pathway uh, where the cleavage is at a different point, and that uh, cleaves into what we call a beta. And it's the a beta which then uh, uh, forms, uh, joins to form. So the monomeric a beta joins to form oligomers, joins to form protofibrils, joins to form fibrils, and ends up being densely. Uh, dense plaques populating the intra, inter, intercellular space. <clears throat> so what we see here, are there are lots of opportunities for intervention. And obviously, you know, people are working hard to uh, try different compounds to uh, attack this at uh, different places. And we should look at that in a minute. <clears throat> in terms of the just a general treatments overview, um, one uh, approach is uh, plaque removal. Another approach is plaque prevention. Now, if we want to go into the tau, which uh, is thought to precede plaque, tau aggregation in the cells, people are investigating 
uh, inhibitors. Uh, these are fairly targeted processes. Um, more systemic uh, approaches are looking at inflammation, uh, uh, metabolic interventions, vascular interventions. Of course, then there is the lifestyle choices, exercise, alcohol, uh, and uh, smoking, I think, are the, the main ones. Uh, there is some discussion over if there is a, a beneficial level of alcohol, a very small amount. Um, my, my personal view is that that is very unlikely uh, to be the case. I, I think uh, ethanol, no matter high, how high quality it might be, uh, is effectively uh, a poison uh, to the brain. <clears throat> so this is uh, looking at the drug development pipeline uh, as presented by Jeff Cummings. Uh, who is, I just think, does absolutely excellent work. Uh, and this is, uh, if you like, presenting, I won't say every drug, but the vast majority of drugs that are in development, according to the phase of development, uh, the uh, mechanism of action, and the participants that they are, that they are targeting. And uh, if we zoom in, we can see that we have, uh, in the phase three space, uh, four compounds, and we're going to look very, very briefly at gantanurabab, uh, lecanemab, and aducanumab. Um, uh, and these compounds, if you like, are the closest we have to providing a disease-modifying therapy. Most of the drugs in development are targeting disease-modifying, uh, uh, are attempting to modify the disease process. Uh, so there are very few which are looking at the psychiatric symptoms and cognitive enhancers. Uh, so I, I think it's quite reasonable that, that big pharma see the, the real value, the immediate value in terms of disease modifying therapies. And of course, that's extremely attractive uh, to uh, people with, with dementia. <clears throat> so let's go on to uh, a, a controversial study. Uh, uh, two studies, in fact, emerge. Uh, and engage. And here we have the uh, results of uh, PET amyloid uh, comparing placebo with high and low dose in each of the studies. And as you can see, there is a very uh, clear effect, and we shall look into uh, what that effect is in a moment. Uh, the problem is, uh, the problem was, of course, that uh, when uh, these results, uh, when these groups were compared for cognitive change, which are, at the end of the day is what is most important to patients, um, the results were much less convincing uh, for a variety of reasons. We, we don't have uh, time to go into them now. Uh, and this puts the regulators in an awkward position because at one sense, uh, in terms of the mechanism, they can say, well, we have an effect. Uh, if you uh, uh, support the amyloid hypothesis, we have a very clear effect. Uh, but for whatever reason, we cannot demonstrate that cognitively. And they came out with the idea that they would license, this is the FDA, that they would license aducanumab um, to see if it was used, whether it worked or not, in a longer term uh, real world study, as opposed to an efficacy trial. And, and this caused an awful lot of um, uh, consternation because many trialists consider it to be slightly bending the rules for a regulator to do this. And uh, I think as a result, the take up of aducanumab uh, marketed as aduhelm in the US has been very, very limited. Uh, so we we could argue we're on the cusp of something, but actually um, the there is little consensus over well, whether uh, this should be licensed and uh, what further studies uh, should be undertaken. Then along recently just came uh, another uh, finding from the Canamab, uh, and this uh, was, we haven't seen the final, we haven't seen the formal results, but obviously the FDA have, and you know, they are impressed, and uh, have, uh, I, I think it's well down the licensing track. And what is interesting here is looking at how different drugs uh, target different, uh, if you like, stages in the amyloid process. So the darker uh, shading here shows you that there is, this is where the, the, the drug, this is the part of the amyloid process that the drug targets most effectively. So as I said earlier, you have the, uh, the A-beta monomer, forms an oligomer, 
protofibrils and then fibrils. And we discover that uh, aducanumab uh, uh, was really targeting mostly the fibrils. And another drug, which I think the trial will finish in 2023, uh, seems to be also targeting uh, the, the fibrils. But lecanumab is going for the protofibril. So it's attacking the, the mechanism at an earlier stage. And it may be that it is this earlier stage which is the, the difference between uh, um, lecanumab and aducanumab, and we anticipate gantanerumab. Another way of looking at this is how does these drugs, uh, how effectively do these drugs engage with the different stages of amyloid uh, production? And again, this is very simply showing you that uh, lecanumab is much more efficient at binding uh, to the protofibrils um, than the other drugs. And it, it, it's very clear, uh, I think, uh, quite impressive. So here we have the complexity. We have uh, many different ways to attack the problem. It seems that going earlier uh, is, is, the, uh, is more effective. Uh, and I find this very encouraging. And I think a whole uh, farmer in general is finding this encouraging. And I suspect all the big players are dusting off uh, their uh, uh, amyloid drugs and looking to take them into uh, uh, the next stage of testing. And this is where um, the issue of uh, translation uh, comes into it. So. So let's look at the uh, dementia research landscape. Uh, we have, uh, over the last 10 years, um, a dementia has gone from being a Cinderella uh, subject to being virtually a public health problem number one. Uh, and that has involved various investments by different government departments and different charities over the years. If we look at the what we might describe as the translation pipeline, although I, my view is that it's really a circle, um, uh, we have the UK Dementia Research Institute, you know, very well funded, uh, going for renewal. I'm very confident it will be renewed. Um, and that's looking at basic science. This is discovery science, um, what's going on in the lab, in the test tube and um, in various animal models. Um, and then you have Dementia Platform UK, which is focused on uh, translation. Uh, and then another large infrastructure is Health Data Research UK, uh, which is really linking up uh, electronic health records at scale uh, to make them uh, available more broadly. And from a translation point of view, um, Dimensions Platform has access to cohort data, which I'll describe later. It is developing a risk stratified uh, recruitment mechanism. And through its cohort data, it is able to look at surveillance. Uh, which you might describe as a phase four trial. If we go down to the bottom of the uh, of the slide, we say that there are various other uh, infrastructures, interested stakeholders. We have venture capital with the Dementia Discovery Fund. We have recruitment to studies through joint dementia research. Very detailed blue ribbon experimental medicine study in EPAD. And Oxford and uh, Cambridge and London are part of the Drug Discovery Institute. But the issue here really, for certainly myself and Dementia's Platform UK, is how do you focus your resources to have greatest strategic effect? Well, um, uh, maybe you can help me answer that question as we, as we go through. So the challenge from a translation uh, perspective is described, I think, quite well uh, by this uh, uh, schematic. Uh, we're all on that black line somewhere, okay? And some of us are sliding faster than others. Uh, but effectively, uh, preclinically, the rate of decline is, is relatively slow. Uh, clinically, which is the red line, uh, clinically is relatively fast, which is the green line. The difference here is that uh, if the rate of decline is, is relatively slow, it's difficult to detect changes. And that means that trials need to be much larger or they need to be much more uh, closely targeted. So just to take clinical uh, paradigms, uh, we might take, I just caricature it and I'm sure you can, I hope you will forgive me for caricaturing it. Now we're gonna take a hundred people here and a hundred people there, hundred with MCI, hundred without. We're going to uh, look at uh, how, how changes occur over six weeks. 
Um, and that's not that, that's a good start, but actually we're looking at much more tightly uh, defined studies uh, where people are um, recruited by genotype, sorry, by phenotype according to genotype, that we so that we can target very specific mechanisms to make it easier to detect change. And I think this is uh, uh, very attractive to the general public. Uh, I, I think the term um, uh, most uh, evidence is that the general public are, are really quite willing to take part in these studies, uh, as we shall discover. So now I'm going to talk about Dementia's Platform UK, because Dementia's Platform UK is a translational platform. It was established by MRC uh, to, uh, for this purpose. Um, but it was, it's, it's a, how can I put this? It, really, it's a bit of a natural experiment. Um, you know, we are uh, the first of its kind in the UK, and we have a, a very well-defined remit, but a very broad area of operation. Um, I'm extremely grateful uh, to MRC for its funding envelope, but relative to larger um, uh, initiatives, uh, the funding envelope is modest. Uh, and this has really led to a, uh, a strategic decision how can we shape the environment best um, uh, for the longer term? Uh, and this has costs as well as benefits. But I'm going to as I go through Dimensions Platform UK, and I really welcome your thoughts as we uh, draw to the end of the presentation. So basic to Deep UK is our industry academic partnership. Um, we have uh, a large number of partners. Uh, and you know it's sometimes a challenge to to keep everybody happy, but by and large it works extremely well. And one of the key reasons it works extremely well is that we have a pre-competitive, high trust uh, ethos. Our network is pre-competitive and high trust. We share our our scientific endeavour. We align our goals. We share our ideas, data, and technologies, and we share risks and successes. And I suppose that it, that is very uh, precious to me, uh, that we maintain the, the trust of all of our partners through transparency, because at that point, uh, people become more generous with their time, more generous with their resources, whether they be ideas, data and technologies. And it just benefits the greater good. Um, we also are very keen to be flexible and agile. So we're question focused. Now, this uh, is uh, difficult to achieve, actually, because much of what we do is developing the infrastructure to allow us to be question focused um, and uh, to develop our programs uh, based on success. Uh, and that's that's a real challenge of balancing resources uh, for short and long term wins. And we also have an integrated informatics structure so that we can have transparent and rapid uh, data management. And over the years, this has developed into having a multimodal capability so that we can bring uh, complex data and simplify complex data uh, to give it to make it accessible to a broader community of science scientists. You know, I have to commend MRC on this because to some extent, I think they took a punt here. They, they took a risk. Um, uh, this is not the normal uh, platform, it's not the normal grant structure, it's not the normal partnerships, but nevertheless, it seems to be working. And so I, I hope that they are, are you know, satisfied with their investment. So let's just see, how do we enable uh, dementia translation? Well, obviously, we develop high-level collaborations, and I've, I've uh, mentioned those. Uh, we enhance the infrastructure and we've targeted uh, data discovery, uh, precision recruitment and industry led experimental medicine. Um, and then we focus, we, we, we focus our strategy around shaping the UK translation environment. So it's not so much is deep UK a success, it's is the UK a success. Uh, and I think this again involves trade offs between quick wins and long-term uh, uh, long value. Our focus is on mechanism discovery through experimental medicine, um, uh, clinical testing, uh, again, looking at early phase trials, 
and then through our cohorts uh, surveillance. Uh, Preclinical testing we leave to the DRI uh, and uh, efficacy. Uh, I, I think um, that's a very complicated uh, environment and I'm hoping that that will clarify over the next uh, year or two. But currently we do not um, uh, emphasize or engage in efficacy trials. So let's look at our data portal. We have around uh, 50 cohorts uh, uh, involving individual level data from three and a half million individuals. Um, we have received around a thousand access requests from large number of registered users uh, in over a hundred institutions or around the, the globe. The interesting thing though, is our process, our decision time. Uh, we typically have a, mo well, we have a modal decision time you know, from application to agreement from the data controllers, who are the cohort owners, we are only data processors, of about 23 days. Um, this varies according to the frequency of data access committee meetings. Uh, some are very quick and some are hmm, long. Uh, but once we do have approval, um, we can provide the data, uh, provide access to the data within one to two days. When I say provide access, we do not uh, send data anywhere, you come, we bring the scientists to the data because this makes for a much more secure and uh, transparent and auditable process, which the data controllers appreciate. For our trial delivery framework, we focus on precision recruitment uh, and uh, we will look into the registers that we have for that and efficient trials delivery. Now, the UK is an, you know, an interesting place. Um, it can do cardiovascular trials uh, at pace and scale, and it's probably the world's best place for doing it. Um, translating this into dementia studies has, has proven extremely difficult. But we are working on this um, gently behind the scenes, uh, creating networks of uh, sites that, that have similar mindsets to us, and they, want, they really do want to be efficient and effective uh, in terms of uh, developing treatments uh, for dementia. And then our third stream is our experimental medicine incubator. Uh, so uh, here we are lining up uh, industry interests, academic interests, uh, pooling our resources and focusing on synaptic health, vascular health and neuroimmunology. But the critical thing here is we are exclusively interested in doing studies in humans. And that we've we received lots of arguments about could our money be used for a, you know, a dog study here, uh, a mouse study there, et cetera, et cetera. But, but really, you know, that, that, that's, we're fairly intractable on this. Um, it's human focused. Doing human studies has, has its own challenges. They are difficult enough. We really don't want to dissipate our resources. Um, on very, very high quality animal studies or very high quality laboratory studies, um, because the real issue is how can we do studies in people? So this is uh, the overview of our translational hub. Um, the data portal is led by Professor Ronan Lyons from uh, Swansea, uh, supported by uh, Professor Simon Thompson. Uh, the uh, trial delivery framework is led by Vanessa Raymond, uh, supported by Dr. Ivan Kwechev. Uh, the incubator is uh, led by uh, Professor uh, James Rowe. And we also have, these are associate directors of Deep UK, and we also have an associate director representing industry, who is Dr. Ian Chessel from AstraZeneca, and an associate director representing in the third sector, who is Dr. Susan Colhars from AIUK. And I have to say, I'm extremely grateful to all of these people um, for uh, effectively making Deep UK work. I think without them, it would be a, a real, real challenge. So they're very generous and supportive. But the basic, uh, if you like, the logic behind it, if we go to step one, uh, we can generate hypotheses uh, from real world data, from our cohort studies to be tested in the incubator. Uh, of course, these hypotheses need to be tested in targeted samples. So step two is also using uh, data portal uh, data to uh, 
risk stratify volunteers in our risk register. And not just stratify them, risk stratify them, but let's find some sites where we can do these studies uh, quickly. So we have targeted recruitment to early phase studies as step three. And then the results of those studies are fed back into the data portal uh, so we can cross uh, check experimental readouts against observational data. So that is the basic paradigm. Um, some things work better than others. I have to be honest with you. I'm, I'm very happy uh, to acknowledge where things work well and where things don't work so well. And we will probably come on to that as we go through. Let's look at experimental medicine in Q beta. Um, it's very interesting that although uh, vascular disease is a big contributor to dementia, uh, it's very hard to get uh, pharma to be interested in this. And so we have to take a step back and look at existing data to identify tractable uh, drug targets for trials and repurposing uh, of, uh, of drugs for trials. And you know, if you have any suggestions on how we can attract greater pharma interest, I would be very pleased to hear it. <clears throat> For neuroimmunology, we're looking at the immune biomarkers according to genetic risk. Uh, and uh, there we have several studies, NTAD and SHINE, uh, which uh, you will find in the literature. Uh, and uh, for synaptic health, we have biomarkers for, for synaptic loss and cognitive decline. So we have about, I think, between, I think we have around 10 uh, studies ongoing. Uh, due to COVID, they, they've been delayed. I think COVID, uh, we lost two years, effectively. Uh, not only were we unable to recruit and put people through clinics, but obviously the prices of all our uh, consumables uh, went up. And this has been a major logistic uh, and uh, economic cost challenge to us. I think we're through it, but it was a, a major headache um, for, for the last uh, year as we began to regather to pursue the science. For the chart delivery framework, we have a participant discovery enrollment uh, environment so that we have consentory contact. Uh, we have consentory contact according to genotype, uh, but uh, we are reluctant to make genotype ge genotypic information on individuals available uh, routinely. Uh, we have a leading cognition, uh, and we have preclinical and early clinical recruitment. Uh, we have procedures and structures for that. The next step is described as clinical service integration. And we're trying to get hold of a network to create a network, establish help. We just want to be facilitative, but we're not trying to um, <clears throat> be in period about it. Uh, a network of uh, memory clinics, brain health centers, uh, where we can access routinely collected data, but effectively uh, get people to uh, agree on the measures. You know, why don't we measure cognitive decline collectively, uh, more cheaply, more efficiently, but also comparably? Uh, so we're we're in those discussions, uh, and then obviously the next thing is leading into uh, trials network, and well, we have I think. Uh, between 14 and 15 sites with MOUs signed up. And these, these agreements aren't exclusive. We, you know, we, we hope that each site will have as many agreements as possible um, with other networks. But the issue here is standardizing practice so that it can be uh, streamlined uh, and have transparent uh, uh, governance arrangements and transparent and standard cost templates. Let's just uh, look at the registers. Um, we have a, a glowing, growing number. We have around 68,000 individuals in one register, which is an opt-in register. And we have uh, 7,000, call it 8,000 individuals um, in our opt-in register. Um, for those, we have 49,000 uh, with health questionnaires, 33,000 with cognitive phenotyping, uh, and 20,000 with GWAS. And at the moment, our uh, client relations and management system is engaged in 10 studies uh, going from uh, approval for access through to selection through to enrollment. 
Now that all sounds wonderful. Well, it may not, but uh, to some people it sounds wonderful. But this is actually very, very difficult. Uh, getting a slick pipeline, um, which uh, is, is efficient, uh, secure, uh, is uh, not straightforward. Um, but uh, nevertheless, we're, we're working on this. The other issue is, of course, the business model. And uh, uh, we are mandated by MRC for this to be uh, self-funding uh, within, uh, certainly by the end of, of our award. Uh, but settling on the right business model, again, it is very challenging. Um, are you facilitating uh, uh, a large number of studies? Uh, are you leveraging resource to standardize systems? Uh, are you uh, in competition or working with CROs? Th these are complex questions, and we have been reluctant to commit ourselves early uh, to one particular model. Uh, but nevertheless, um, I am being encouraged uh, to uh, stop procrastinating uh, and um, start deciding how we're going to be self-sustaining. <clears throat> um, I don't know what that little box up there is, is, is doing. Um, so Great Minds, uh, blood-based biomarker pilot study uh, starting, we are characterizing through genotyping act actigraphy. We have a feasibility tool so that uh, people are able to, to go in, see what the level of characterization is, see how many individuals within the uh, register are suitable, and that would allow them to decide whether they want to take it further uh, and uh, contact these individuals uh, for recruitment. Mm -hmm. If we go to the trials network, um, we have 14 sites agreed to be affiliated. I think it's 15 now. Uh, we're trying to standardize consents and data, as I said earlier, uh, so that we uh, are able to conduct the trials that we have under consideration uh, in a cost-effective and efficient way. Uh, we are working with other networks, Neuronet, uh, GapNet. Um, we've appointed some staff uh, and engaged uh, a, um, how can I put this, a CRO consultant to help us up our game. So let's go on to the data portal. Now, the data portal is the most mature element of DPUK. Um, it's been going the longest. Uh, effectively, we have a one-stop shop end-to-end -end data management process uh, where people can discover data, uh, access data, and analyze data. So the we have various dis data discovery tools, which you can, if you go to the web under the DPUK data portal, you can play with. Um, we, we broker access with the data controller. So for example, if you have a cohort which, whose data we host, you remain the legal guardian of access to that cohort. We just make it easy for you to say yes or no to specific applications. And then once access has been granted, we provide uh, an analysis environment which has and a very broad range of statistical tools, both generic and specialist. You are given your own uh, laboratory environment, your virtual laboratory environment. It is secure and you can play with the data. Um, obviously, you can play with the data according to the permissions you've been given, uh, but nevertheless, uh, it is very, very uh, flexible. The challenge, though, is, is changing the culture. Um, you know, we are used to having data on a memory state, which we put into our uh, our laptop as we're on a long journey. Uh, I think as data become more sensitive, more identifiable, as the public become more concerned, uh, these, these practices are, are no longer tenable. Uh, and I think my belief is it would just take one lawsuit uh, for formal change uh, to be applied uh, by law. Uh, we want to avoid that. I think it's a very heavy handed solution. Um, and will be very restrictive uh, to, to the scientific environment. So what we, what we have is a platform where people log on, um, they have to identify themselves, two-factor identification. They're then given their own research space. They can do genetic imaging survey work in that research space. Uh, it's actually safer uh, and uh, cheaper. Um, so that's the data portal. Let's look into some details. It's rather a big uh, um, architecture, actually. So first of all, if you're sorry, if you're doing end-to-end -end data management, it's not a simple task. First of all, you have to ingest or upload data. 
Um, <clears throat> so that's what we do. Um, then you have to curate it to a standard, and we'll come on to that uh, uh, shortly. Your platform needs to be interoperable. There are certain uh, jurisdiction issues about the, the transfer of data. Uh, so you really do want your platform to be interoperable with platforms in Australia or platforms in Korea, the US uh, and Europe. The data need to be discoverable. So we have data discovery tools that uh, they can be queried. Uh, and then we need to, as I said earlier, ac broker access. Uh, this, is, this is very, very difficult, actually, because we come from a culture uh, where uh, academic rewards primarily come from what you might describe as a competitive dividend. And this means one, you know, one is very careful about uh, sharing data or providing data access. Uh, what we'd like to do is just make it easy for people to be transparent about their decisions. So we develop fail fast approval criteria so that if you're not interested in sharing your data, you can tick a box. We know why you've said no, we can move, all move on. We also have standard legal and access agreements um, uh, because university research team, um, legal teams uh, have a lot of churn. Um, frequently the, the uh, individuals do not have a research background. They may not understand they are risk averse. We would like them to be familiar with agreements so that they know exactly what they're signing and they can sign it rapidly. And then through our research uh, registers, we can have recontact for clinical studies. Then comes the data analysis layer. We provide tools, personal workspaces. The workspaces be con configured for consortia uh, and uh, the uh, container uh, icon there really is for federated analyses across, across platforms. And we're just slowly building our knowledge and management environment, but this is, <laughs> that's more aspirational than actual. I shall move on rapidly. So let's talk about access to research-ready data. We upload native data from the cohort as is, and we do that to make it as easy as possible uh, for the cohort to make their data available. By and large, cohorts are not resourced for data sharing. Uh, and they're not resourced for cleaning the data to a standard suitable for third party use. Which, so we will do it, you know, we're, we're financed to do that, we're budgeted to do that. For the epi, uh, ep epidemi epidemiologic and survey data uh, and clinical data, we curate it to a common data model. Um, we then use that common data model to create a data catalog and uh, create a data dictionary. Uh, we then populate the, the discovery tools with uh, and, and the cohort directory using this data model. And where, where we think it's helpful, and it's not always helpful, we would harmonize a core variable data set uh, so that you can see, uh, look at distributions, such as such, et cetera, across data sets. Um, we would make available to researchers uh, the data in various formats and then return the data dictionary curated uh, to the cohort. Now, this is a process. It is very labor intensive. Um, we are working it through at the moment. I think we have three or four cohorts where it's complete. Um, but nevertheless, our view is that this is, uh, in terms of UK PLC, this is well worth doing. <clears throat> if I take a step back for a minute, uh, we have this raw uploaded data. So let's just say you're an imager. And you, know, you just love DICOM and Nifty files. And you just want to get your hands on as many DICOM and Nifty files as you wish. We can do that, we can do that. But I can't do that personally. I, I wouldn't know one end of a, a DICOM file from another, but I would really like to know how imaging is related to smoking or exercise. So then we might develop some image-derived phenotypes, and those image-derived phenotypes would also be made available to the research community. Um, for native survey data, we would develop it into the CSERV model. And what this allows us to do is to create virtual laboratories where non-specialists can access multimodal data. And uh, we find that uh, this is really our niche. Um, there are there are platforms, you know, several platforms where you can look at epidemiologic data, or you can look at imaging data or genetics data. 
but bringing it all together and pre-processing it so that it's accessible to the broad um, scientific community is, is unusual. But that's really what we think we should do. Now, this is, a, as I say, it's time consuming. Um, it's thankless. You don't get your nature paper out of this. But we, we think that in the longer run, this will uh, make a, a substantial difference. So we have end-to-end -end data management. Uh, we are developing that for data and tissue discovery, uh, recontact for trials, uh, data access, data analysis, and then we do training um, because uh, using a platform is not the same thing as using a laptop. So people need to be working through uh, the different culture and the different priorities. And to be honest, the different disciplines of, of, uh, of uh, using a data platform. Let's look at two examples now of uh, how we prepare the data. This is our CSERV model. On the left there, you have uh, basically uh, data broken down into to convenient groups. I uh, don't have a, a very technical word for, for that. Um, we can look at those groups. They're really self-evident. There's nothing very special about it. Uh, but from these groups, uh, we can have a four-level tiered uh, data model which allows you uh, to identify what you want uh, rapidly. So if we look at cognitive status, the next T would be various cognitive domains. And then we would look at uh, what we describe fairly arbitrarily as families of tests, uh, of procedures, uh, and then particular test scores. And we could modify this per community. For example, uh, psychometric communities would like to know, would like access to individual item scores. Uh, non specialist would just like access to the, the scale score. So does it work? So this is a, uh, th these are data from uh, an article about this research model in the European Journal of Epidemiology, it's in press. We took 25 variables uh, in, uh, I think it was two co cohorts, maybe three, uh, and we uh, searched these variables using the native data that was provided by the cohort. In order to identify these 25 variables, uh, understand them, it took between five and six hours uh, per cohort. Doing something comparable with the data model, it took 15 minutes per cohort because you didn't have to learn the data model. Once you'd learned it once, it was common across all the cohorts. So I, I think that, um, uh, even though these are wonderfully convenient results for me, and I'm sure it would be uh, uh, slightly different if we did it in different cohorts. Nevertheless, I think the order of magnitude here uh, speaks for itself. Okay, let's look at research-ready imaging data. Um, so it's very interesting that the whole process of people adopting uh, using uh, data platforms uh, to some extent depends on a champion. Um, we've been trying to, if you like, break in to the, the imaging market uh, for some time. Uh, and then uh, a young man called Rick Henson from Cambridge realized that, that actually he gets fed up sending his data to everyone. He would like quite, he would like quite to, to have everyone sent to his data. Uh, and that's what we do. And all of a sudden the imaging community has, has taken off it, its takes up a third of all our ap ap applications at the moment. And of course, these are big data applications and they take up our reserve capacity uh, for storage and compute power. So this is a really great problem to have, uh, it, it is. Uh, so we've had to rethink our entire approach to storing data. We no longer, we are working towards leaving storing it as files and uh, effectively storing it as a data lake, which people can take buckets out of. So it's object storage. This reduces uh, the, the total uh, storage requirement you know, from petabytes to terabytes. We are standardizing, just so we have a CSERV data model, we're standardizing the imaging data to a bid structure. Um, we were very pleased to discover bids because it meant we didn't have to make one up. And uh, I think this is a much better solution than anything we, we could have done. So again, you just have to learn one data model, uh, one data structure in order to access these data. And then you might like to note, uh, record, and uh, communicate within your community 
uh, by having your own Jupyter Hub uh, notebook. In parallel to that, we have uh, a work package which is looking at analysis pipelines. Uh, so effectively, this is led. Well, sorry, this is led by uh, Claire Mackay, uh, and uh, effectively is taking the uh, UK Biobank uh, processing pipelines, taking raw images into image drive phenotypes, and standardizing those so that they can be applied to other data sets. So here we have a standard data model, tools for use, and uh, tools to simplify the problem for the use of non-specialists. So here we are, these are our, our partners. Uh, I'm extremely grateful to them. They've been very patient as we've worked through the, the teething problems, and we will continue to work through the challenges of, of trying to get this to, to all run very, very smoothly. Um, we, we have good relationships with them, um, and I look forward to working with them more closely. Now, what is interesting here is that we, there is something announced by the government called the Barbara Windsor uh, Initiative. And there is interest in NIHR in their dementia mission. So we anticipate that the investment in this space is going to increase substantially over the next 12 months. I mean, I accept we live in, in a politically uncertain uh, environment at the moment, but let's be um, slightly optimistic about this at some point. Um, this will happen because dementia will not go away. What we hope is that we've positioned Deep UK to be a major influence on these initiatives. Um, we have good, as Masood so kindly said, we have good relationships uh, with industry. Uh, we have, and these are transparent relationships. Um, people know exactly what's going on. Uh, we have uh, good networking across trial sites and with research registers. We have, uh, I think, an unsurpassed integrated data <coughs> uh, capability. Uh, and our experience of bringing academic and industry experimenters together has been very valuable. Uh, so much so that, you know, if at the end of the year there's an underspend uh, in a particular company, it's not unknown for DPK to, be, uh, to receive a little phone call saying, is there anything we could do together? So I hope that DPUK is in a position to shape these initiatives. Um, I think that uh, the going, if you like, from being a, a very uh, difficult environment to do dementia trials to becoming a world leading environment for doing dementia trials, it really is within our grasp. Um, but I do think it would require you know, every, every one of us uh, to think how best we can contribute to this. So, Thank you very much, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, really clear, John. Thank you for that. Um, so I'll encourage everyone else to put some questions in the chat, and maybe I could start off and uh, kick, kick off the discussion. So you mentioned at the beginning the disease-modifying drugs, amyloid-clearing drugs, and obviously that's very exciting. Um, but it's also the place where pharma is very highly focused because new drugs mean, you know, in terms of investment and money for them, that's quite a big thing. And then you also mentioned that the vascular targets are not something that pharma are very keen on. And the obvious reason is because you can get blood pressure down very easily with drugs which are off license. So I wondered whether there's a model where you don't need pharma to do the obvious trials that if uh, government partners were actually interested, including MRC, you could do those trials through government funding. And of course, MRC funded very large trials in the past, which were highly successful. Um, and I just wondered what you think about having non-pharma partners do the trials. I think it's a great idea. Absolutely great idea. The issue is identifying and making a strong case, mm -hmm. uh, a compelling argument for MRC funding. Um, uh, the MRC process is, is highly competitive, highly critical, which means you get trials of a high standard. But sometimes you need to take a risk. Uh, and, I, 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 and there is a caveat here, actually. Um, one of the reasons why the evidence is difficult to collect in a 
to make a compelling argument is that accessing electronic health records, which in fact, you know, we had wonderful electronic health records, but accessing them to, to make the case is actually very, very difficult. Um, linking electronic health records to research data, which would be the holy grail here, mm. is, um, is a very expensive and uh, administratively obstructed process. Um, so is, wasn't it interesting that when COVID came along, the solution came along, no problem at all. Yeah. Uh, but the, getting that sort of specific UK case to, to become generic is not proving uh, easy. Uh, my view is that this is a ministerial issue um, and really there ought to be a very high level intervention to say, guys, let's do this because it would transform our ability to repurpose drugs. Yeah, I mean, um, you know, we've got NHS Digital and obviously that is a very important platform also for linking just ordinary healthcare. Um, and there are obviously tens of thousands of people put it, being put on antihypertensives every week. Um, so if we were to link in to that data that's already out there, maybe you don't even have to do the trial. It could be done on the sort of observational basis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. I've got a question from Claire here, um, Claire Mackay. What do the cardiologists do that we haven't so far to do the sorts of trials you described? <clears throat> I think the uh, when I say the cardiologists, I also mean the epidemiologists. You know, I, I think um, uh, CTSU uh, of just you know, and the uh, the um, trial they did on on COVID uh, just demonstrated the power of thinking differently about this. And uh, when I you know engaged with the uh, various scientific communities associated with dementia, that there's a reluctance to think differently, to think outside the box. Uh, and it, it really is not hard to think, okay, why can't we do a very large scale trial um, rather than just a small scale, you know, with a very intensive uh, mm. measurement protocol. Now they're both needed. Yes, they ask different questions, but they're synergistic in putting the evidence together to make the compelling case for further investment and further questions. Mm. So let's think outside the box. Let's um, just learn from the recovered trial uh, and uh, do the big dementia trial. Yeah, I think it's really possible. Cornelia has a question here. She says, fantastic talk. Do we make clear enough to the regulators that the dementia epidemic justifies an approach like the one followed for COVID? Well, there's a there's a question. Um, when I'm when uh, Deep UK and a, a previous consortium I was involved in called Roadmap engaged with regulators, they were very pleased to engage. They want to be brought in at an early stage to understand the the measurements so that they have confidence in the judgments uh, they make. But that's regulators for, if you like, drug licensing. Regulators for data access, I think they, they are extremely defensive. Uh, and uh, I, I've, I've found it uh, like pushing blamange up a hill, if I'm honest with you. Uh, so any leverage we can put into that area would be very welcome. Yeah, I think there are lots of exciting possibilities if we can get people to listen. Um, Sophia Toniolo says, great talk. A question on the first part on the anti-amyloid therapies. If the difference in efficacy lies within how early you tackle disease pathology in terms of you know, the protofibrils, for example, are we not missing good biomarkers of early pathology in cognitively unimpaired individuals and patients? In other words, you know, are the current biomarkers, whether it's in blood or CSF or imaging, um, are they actually too crude? Should we be trying to get biomarkers of those protofibrils, monomers, um, oligomers, et cetera? Um, yes, it's interesting to me that one of the big industry interests is uh, validating biomarkers for early detection. 
Um, I, I think in these initiatives that I concluded with, this will be a big part of the program. Uh, so industry will buy in, in my view, if there is a program to develop these very early stage uh, biomarkers. Yeah, and I guess, Sophia, the, the other question is, how do you get those biomarkers? How do you get to the uh, oligomers and protofibrils, even in the CSF? Um, uh, that's not it's necessarily very easy, is it? Mm -hmm. Is there anyone else who's got a question for John? So, um, John, the other thing you've said is obviously you've got all these cohorts from different people, but you, you're also establishing one uh, which is much more DP UK centric, the Great Minds one. And how? what are your thoughts about that? Where, where is that going? The, the beauty of Great Minds is that because we've recruited it de novo, um, we are in the position to make it very accessible. Uh, it, the governance is very straightforward. Um, I think we would like to expand it, and I think we would like to characterize it more closely. Uh, I'm in very preliminary discussions with uh, MRC about how to genotype the entire cohort, and they're very open to an application. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, you know, if there's one or two of you out there want to help me put in an application to, you know, genotype 7,000 individuals, um, you know, drop me an email. Right. Yeah. And I, and I guess the, uh, the advantage of this is that you could have a national network. Yeah. Um, and perhaps if, if uh, the advertising and, and the outreach was done properly, it would be also potentially more representative of different types of communities that are often well represented in the other cohorts, because you're starting from afresh. Yeah, I, I, I think so. And that, again, here's where you have to pick your battles. Um, mm. uh, I think the current battle is characterizing what we have and um, streamlining our procedures so that it's use, usable, cost effective, so that it's self-sustaining. When you have that model, it's much easier to one, generate your, your own income for developing it, two, go into other funders to say, look, you know, we want to work in the uh, uh, South Asian community. You know, we, and then you can, but uh, it's been a real tough you know, line to walk between mm -hmm. making something which is a bit primitive work well and developing something more innovatively, but it's slower to become slick. Yeah, no, I, I can understand. But anyway, it's a great opportunity. And I don't think we've got uh, any more questions, John, but we're just coming to the end of the hour anyway. Thanks so much. It was a fantastic overview of what's going on. And as I say, if there's anyone who actually has a, a handle on all, all sides of the dementia research framework <laughs> in the UK, it's John. So thanks again, John. Thank you. Thank you, Masud. Bye-bye.